Hello, kitties. Be sure to subscribe. And click that bell. Yes, Freddy, we know. Click the bell. That way you'll always be up to date on all the latest slasher mayhem brewing in the 80s slasher library. And click that thumbs up. Because if you don't, I'll make sure you never have pleasant dreams again. And be sure to follow the 80s slasher librarian on Twitter. Join the Facebook group page and the subreddit. Links in the description below. Join now, or playtime will be over. <laughs> Tonight's upload is brought to you by the patrons of the 80s slasher librarian. That's Alleyway and DK. Bonanza Jelly Bean. Free girl, Dave Arnold, Alex Vanover, Carl Eakins, Cecilia Spears, Krista Campbell, Allison Saib, Hawaii, Iron Elixir, Jay Gardner, Catherine McClear, Kristen Kay, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Rob Davy, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. Thank you, kitties, for supporting the channel on Patreon. We couldn't do it without you. And anyone listening right now, if you would like to support this channel and see it keep going and growing for years to come, then check out the links in the description below for the Patreon page and the merch store. As a patron of the 80 Slasher Librarian, you'll get free Slasher and Horror ebooks, free merch from the merch store, and you can even voice a character in an audiobook every month depending on your tier. Check it out. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. There's a lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker. We kill the flame. Friday the 13th by Simon Hawk. Chapter 5. Marcy picked her way carefully along the path to the latrine, a large cabin set back from the others in a clearing surrounded by a grove of trees. The rain was starting to let up a little bit, but the storm was still going, and little streams of water were running down the path reflecting the beam of her flashlight. She entered the building and flicked on the lights by the door. Water had found its way into the cabin. It was puddled up near the entrance and by the showers. She walked around it to the bathroom stalls, slipped out of her slicker, entered one of the stalls, and put the flashlight down at her feet. Steve had obviously neglected to repaint the bathroom in his rush to make sure everything was operable. The inside walls of the stall and the surface of the door were covered with graffiti left by former campers. Forty yards to the outhouse by Willie Make It, Marcy read. She grimaced. Come on, kids, you can do better than that. She checked to make sure the seat was clean. Well, she thought, this will probably be tomorrow's detail. Steve would probably have them in here scrubbing down the floor in the stalls again after the rain and painting over all the old graffiti which would only provide a fresh, clean, irresistible surface for the new campers who would arrive at the end of next week. She wondered what the point was. People were going to draw on walls no matter what you did. It was a way of saying, I was here. Some called it vandalism, others labeled it inner city art. Like a writer she saw on The Tonight Show who said it was, what was it, a new form of urban abstract expressionism? or something like that. But the bottom line was that people, especially kids, needed attention. A way of making their presence felt. A way of marking out their turf. Adults got to put personalized license plates on their cars, signs with their names on their houses and front lawns and mailboxes, personalized checks and gave business cards and stationery, brass nameplates on their office desk and plastic nameplates on their office doors, initials on their briefcases and monograms on their pocket handkerchiefs. It was all the same thing, more or less, a way of establishing your identity, of saying, this is me, I did this, I was here. It's most common in big cities. 
Graffiti is rarely seen in small towns, and when it is, as in this case, it was probably done by someone from the city. In small towns, identity was not much of a problem. People knew each other. They took the time to say your name and say hello. In a big city, you often got lost in the crowd. The best attempt at a solution to the problem that she had ever seen was in a bar she went to once. Getting in by borrowing a girlfriend's fake ID, she had a couple of beers and then went to the ladies room where she found that the walls were made of blackboard slate. There was a tray with chalk so people could write whatever they wanted to on the walls on the theory that it would always be erased but someone had wanted to leave a message with more permanence. So she had scratched her initials and date into the slate. You couldn't win, people simply had to do it. Maybe that was why they did it, because you couldn't win. They had to scratch their initials into trees, make footprints in wet cement, spray paint their names on highway overpasses, often coupled with the names of a boy or girlfriend. It was a way of making their presence felt in a world where no one took the time to get to know them. Initials in a heart. We were here, we did this, we lived, we loved. She thought of Jack, of his slim, strong body, the feel of his warm skin, his lips on hers, the way he felt inside her. God, she had wanted him so much, all the time they'd known each other, every time they'd almost done it, come so close that they had both ached with the need for one another. All the time she pulled back when she really wanted to tear his clothes off and attack him. She wondered if she had been his first. He certainly hadn't acted as if he was uncertain or inexperienced, but then would a guy admit it if he was? Nah. She guessed that Jack probably had girls before, and the fact that he hadn't rushed her had made it that much more special. She wondered if he knew she was on the pill. He'd never asked her, but he probably assumed she was, figuring she would have said something if she wasn't, although she knew girls who didn't use anything but didn't let that stop them. Stupid. She wondered if he had thought she was a virgin. In fact, she wasn't. Though she had not been on the pill when she had done it the first time, it hadn't been smart and it certainly hadn't been special. It was long before she met Jack. She had only been 15. The experience left much to be desired. Some of her girlfriends had talked about saving it for when they got married, or at least for the right guy. But that idea had always bothered her. How do you know? How do you know when it was right? How could you know if it was really good with someone that you cared about if you had no basis for comparison? And she had no desire to wait until she got married to have sex. Sex was sex and love was love. And the ideal situation, of course, was when they went together. But you had to know how to tell the difference between the two. Even so, just because you love someone was no reason to marry them. It might be a reason to have sex, but it took more than desire to make a marriage or even a relationship. It seemed like every second or third marriage nowadays was ending in divorce, and she didn't want to be a part of those statistics. The first time had been okay, but that was about all she could say for it. Afterward, it hadn't seemed like a very big deal at all, and that was probably why she had felt so disappointed. It should have been a big deal. Some of her older, more experienced girlfriends had told her about orgasms, about what they felt like, about how incredible it was. She had gotten wet, but she didn't know that that wasn't it. She remembered thinking, okay, so that's what it's like. Well, now I know. She knew there had to be much more to it. She started taking the pill eight months ago. She had frankly expected to have sex with Jack long before this, but she always found herself pulling back at the last moment. It probably wasn't fair to him to get him so hot all those times and then stop just before they passed the point of no return, but then it wasn't just a case of her getting him all hot bothered. It worked both ways. She felt the frustration too. She cared for him. She cared for him a lot, but she didn't want to give in to the feelings of the moment, only to lie there afterward thinking to herself, okay, so that's what it's like with him. Well, now I know. Hell, if a girl just wanted to get laid, it was the easiest thing in the world, especially if she was pretty and had nice tits. She just picked up a fake ID, teamed up with a girlfriend she could trust, and hit some bar where she could be sure you wouldn't run into anyone from school, or she could go to any one of a million places where you could get hit on by older guys. Christ, it happened all the time. 
You got hit on in supermarkets, for God's sake, and in record stores, and just walking down the street, and these days, you didn't even have to wait to get hit on. You could pick out some guy who looked nice, someone who wasn't an obvious sleaze, and you could make the moves yourself. She knew some girls who did just that, who even made a point of going after married men on the theory that they wouldn't hassle you because they had much more to lose. But that wasn't what she wanted. She wanted more, much more. She didn't want a short interlude of heavy breathing and temporary pleasure. She wouldn't settle for just feeling good. She remembered after that first time talking about it with her more experienced girlfriend who had said, God, wasn't it great? Didn't it just make you want to do it with every foxy guy you know? She had said yes because the conversation seemed to call for it, but she hadn't meant it. What she had wanted to say was, yeah, well, I guess it was sort of nice, but is that really all there is? And no, it doesn't make me want to do it with every foxy guy I know. It made me wonder if it's any different with somebody who rubs me. Someone who wants to be inside me, not just in my body, but it made me want to do it with somebody who'd carve our initials on a tree, leave behind more than a memory, a statement. We were here. We did this. We loved. She hated to think of them being apart after this summer. She felt very close to him right now, but she wanted to feel closer because of what they'd shared. It was funny in a way. For as long as they'd been together, there was always that pressure, that slight tension about when it was going to happen. Not if it would happen, but when. There hadn't been any question in her mind about the if for quite some time. And now that it had happened, she felt a pressing need to get even closer to him, to become a part of him especially since they were going to go their different ways after this summer. She just wished she could peel back the layers of his mind and look inside, see and feel what he was really thinking, have it written on the wall of her memory. We were here. We loved. She thought she heard the squeak of the door opening, and she pushed the stall door open and peeked out. Jack? No answer. Jack, is that you? She got up and left the stall, looking around the bathroom. There wasn't anybody there. It must have been the wind pushing the door open, she thought, or maybe just her imagination. She went over to the sink to wash her hands. She turned on the faucet. Nothing came out. She sighed and made a face into the mirror. She stared at her reflection for a moment and made another face at herself. When I look into that mirror, she said, I knew that I'd always be ugly. I said, Lady, you'll always be plain. <laughs> she giggled and then stopped as she heard a footstep behind her in the shadows near the shower cabins. Hello, she said, feeling a little self-conscious. Nothing. She shrugged and tried another faucet. Still no water. Irritated, she struck the faucet with her fist. It didn't help. Great, she thought. That's all they needed. No water. She bent down to look under the sink and saw a cutoff valve on a tea fitting just below the pipes. Aha, she said, crouching down and turning the valve. There was a cough and a sputter from the sink as water began to rush from the faucet. She straightened up and washed her hands, wiping them on her t-shirt, then turned the water off. As she did so, she heard something behind her again. She turned and stared into the shadows at the far end of the bathroom, near the showers. Ned! It would be just like Nettie, she thought, to come popping out at her in his Indian headdress, waving a tomahawk or something. Hey, come on, guys, she said, walking slowly toward the showers. Ali, Ali, oxen free! She approached one of the curtain shower stalls and pulled a chain on a light fixture hanging overhead. She reached out and grabbed the curtain, then abruptly yanked it open. It was empty. There was a slight drip coming from the shower head. She stepped inside and twisted the faucet tighter, shutting off the drip. She pursed her lips and moved back, looking at the second shower stall. Was the curtain moving? She reached out and took hold of the curtain, hesitating, and then jerked it back. Empty, she sighed. Must be my imagination. Outside, the rain started coming down harder. It sounded like pebbles hitting the roof, and the thunder boomed. It seemed as if the sound was getting louder. She thought of her dreams, the rain turning to blood, 
and a shiver ran down her spine. She turned, not seeing the shadow that suddenly appeared on the wall, the shadow of an axe being raised. She turned and saw a face, twisted into a horrifying grimace, a look of sheer terrifying insanity, eyes wide and bulging, lips twisted in a snarl. She saw the axe now held high, saw it coming down. For a brief second, everything switched into slow motion. She couldn't move. She couldn't breathe. She saw the arm beginning its downward swing. She saw the steel blade coming directly at her face. She screamed a scream that was cut off as abruptly and as violently as it had begun. Cut off as it tore from her throat. The steel blade struck her face and she felt the numbing force of its impact. That and nothing more. Just one incandescently brief agonizing blow as it was buried in her forehead, splitting the skull, biting deep into the cranium. She was already dead as she fell back against the wall of the shower cabinet, blood running down her face. The axe embedded in her forehead like some macabre Halloween prop. But the blood was real. It streamed from the deep gash and pattered to the floor like raindrops, running in red streams down the drain. The overhead light swaying crazily back and forth as the door was opened briefly and a gust of wind blew through the bathroom. The door swung closed and everything was quiet again. Only the light fixture swung back and forth, back and forth, briefly illuminating Marcy's body slumped in the shower stall. Then it gradually stopped swinging, leaving her in darkness. <laughs> Chapter 6 Bill was down to his bare feet and he had already lost his shirt. Shoes and socks were the first casualties of the game, and since neither of the girls were wearing socks, he thought they would be even fairly quickly. But Brenda and Alice had managed to stay ahead. Now the tide of the game had turned and things were starting to get interesting. Brenda had lost her shorts on her last turn, and now she rolled the dice and moved her game token across the board. Bill saw she was going to land on one of his properties again. Hello? He grinned. Brenda scowled. Worst run of bad luck since Richard Nixon. She pulled her shirt off. She had a pretty pink bra underneath. The sheer kind with demi cuffs that exposed most of her breasts and left practically nothing to the imagination. It matched her pink bikini panties. Poor Ned, Bill thought. Look what you're missing. Well, that's what happens when you leave the party early. He smiled at Brenda as she dropped her shirt on the floor beside her chair. Well, you can always call it quits if you want to. He said, making it a challenge. That chance countered Brenda as Alice reached for the dice. You're two steps away from Pacific Avenue in Skin City, boy. Ooh, said Bill in mock fright. He thought of Steve Christie coming back from town and walking in on them playing Monopoly stark naked. The thought of the expression on Steve's face almost made him choke on his beer. Whoops, said Alice as she landed on one of Bill's streets. Brenda laughed. Well, what can I say? It's not much, but I call it home. Bill said with an elaborate shrug. He watched appreciatively as Alice started to unbutton her blouse. A sharp gust of wind suddenly blew the door in. Alice gave a little scream as the door flew open and slammed against the inside wall. A brief burst of rain blew into the room. Alice grabbed for the flying play money as Bill jumped up to shut the door. I'll get it! I'll get it! Wait a minute, Brenda shouted, laughing. Grab the money! Oh my god! Screamed Alice. Bill forced the door close against the wind. The game was in shambles. Play money and game tokens and deed cards had flown all over the place. It's blowing like crazy out there, Bill said. Oh, and I think I left the windows of my cabin open, Brenda realized. Shoot! Alice rolled her eyes. Brenda grabbed her slicker and threw it over her shoulder, then bent down to pick up her clothes. Well, we're going to have to finish this game some other night, she said, just when it was getting interesting, too. Okay, said Alice, 
feeling secretly relieved. She started to help Bill pick up the pieces of the game. See you guys in the morning, Brenda said, heading toward the door. See ya. Bill said. Night, said Alice. Another brief gust of wind whistled through the room as Brenda opened the door and quickly shut it behind her. Alice sighed. Look at this mess. She picked up the empty beer bottles and handed them to Bill. Here. He took them from her and she picked up the rest of the empties and headed into the kitchen with him. Hey, tell me. Bill said. Were you really going to go ahead with it? Alice smiled. Actually, I hadn't made up my mind. Well, well, in that case, we'll have to finish the game another night. Oh, yeah? She gave him a playful kick and he ducked out of the way, chuckling. She watched him, wondering what would have happened if the wind hadn't blown the game all over the floor. What would Steve had said if he came back and walked in on them after a few more turns? And would they still be playing Monopoly? Maybe a lot could happen in a week, she thought. And the night wasn't over yet. Steve Christie sat hunched over his coffee at the counter in the general store. It had been a long day running herd on the counselors, trying to get everything organized, and he was sick and tired of constantly running back into town because he had forgotten something. He had wanted to make sure this would be the last trip. He didn't particularly enjoy coming into town and picking up supplies. Not that anyone gave him a hard time, but there was an edge to the way they all behaved around him. They looked at him strangely. They didn't have to say a thing, their eyes did all the talking. Sandy was the one who didn't look at him as if he were his father's ghost. He had lingered at the counter, enjoying a hot dinner, munching a hot slice of apple pie, and nursing his coffee. Much as he used to linger over Cokes and ice cream sodas at the same counter when he was a kid and a much younger Sandy. She used to flirt with him, making him feel older. She always had a smile and a friendly word or two, and if she ever said anything about the camp, she didn't talk about it in his presence. She seemed to understand that it was a sore point with him, and that this was something he needed to do. If for no other reason than to prove everyone wrong about Camp Crystal Lake and his father. I'll make a go of that damn place, he thought. I'll make a go of it and show them what a bunch of superstitious nonsense all of this stuff about Camp Blood is. I'll show them they were wrong about it, just like they were wrong about my dad, a man whose only curse was an incredibly pathetic run of the worst luck in the world. And it would serve them right if I sold the goddamn place for a healthy profit to some real estate developer who would come in and put up condos. He grimaced. That did not seem very likely, although Alice thought it could happen. Lakefront property, she had said. How can lakefront property be worthless? He'd wanted to tell her, tell her the real reason. Instead, what he had told her was that it can be worthless if it's in an area that's economically depressed. Small towns were dying all over the country. No jobs. The agriculture industry was going down the tubes with banks foreclosing on small farms and small town businesses being bled dry as they lost their customers. It would take a lot more to turn things around than an occasional rock concert or music video to benefit the farmer. Every domestic industry was being affected as this country shifted more and more to service industries and moved away from production, unable to compete with cheaper goods and labor from abroad. There had to be production. People had to get back to working with their hands. They had to have faith in themselves again, in their own abilities, in the American spirit. Even the Japanese were saying that. People were buying Japanese cars because they thought they were better than American cars. That the Japanese had better production and better quality control. But even the Japanese admitted that they had learned it from America. He could remember a time when nobody would even touch anything if it said made in Japan. That had changed because the Japanese people had made a commitment to changing it. They had worked hard. He had always made a point of reading about people who had started successful companies, about their beginnings. You learn how to be successful by studying successful people. Soichiro Honda had started with the small repair shop in Hamamatsu in 1928 and built it up into a factory producing piston rings, a factory that was bombed to smithereens during the war. But he hadn't given up. After the war, he started up all over again, 
founding the Honda Technical Research Institute. It was an impressive sounding name, but the institute had actually been only a wooden shed measuring 18 by 12 feet. Honda had bought 500 army surplus engines, hired a few workers and stuck the engines into bicycles, connected them to the rear wheels with a drive belt. They ran on a mixture of gasoline and turpentine and smoked like a plugged up chimney. Not much of a beginning, but look where the Honda Corporation was today and look at Chrysler, he thought. Look at any company where the people really cared what they were doing and you'd see that you can turn anything around if you're willing to work at it. Compared to some of those stories, a rundown summer camp was a joke. But then an 18 by 12 wooden shed that was supposed to be a research institute was a joke as well. Sure, he could have taken the easy way out. He could have put the place up for sale as run down as it was and cut his losses as Alice had suggested. Alice simply didn't understand his dreams. She couldn't appreciate the long view. She didn't even understand the most basic elements of business. To her, lakefront property meant that it wasn't worthless. Never mind that it was a depressed area. Never mind it was falling apart from neglect. Never mind that it had been plagued by bad luck starting with a boy drowning back in 57 and two counselors being brutally murdered in 58 and fires set by some arsonist the year after that and one thing after another ever since. So that people now believe that the place was cursed. He had wanted to tell her the place was worthless because people believed in the curse upon it and upon his family. They thought he was crazy to reopen the camp, to drop $25,000 of his own money to refurbish it and bring in inner city kids. Everyone in town thought drunken old Ralph was crazy with his talk about death curses and the Lord's vengeance, but were they really any better? At least Ralph said what was on his mind. Maybe they didn't say it out loud like Ralph did, but they thought it. He was convinced that some of the problems his father had experienced could be traced directly to the residents of Crystal Lake. He wondered as he went around town picking up supplies. Which of the people he had encountered had been the ones who set the fires? Which ones had vandalized the cabins and poisoned the wells? If there was any curse upon his family, he thought, it had been put there by some of the locals who didn't want to see the camp succeed. They were convinced it was an evil place and they had suited their actions to their beliefs. It was a lot like a salesman who tried to sell a product he didn't believe in. Because he didn't believe in it, he didn't get behind it. And when the product, not surprisingly, didn't sell, he justified his own beliefs, his own failure by saying, see, it's just no good. I knew it all the time. Well, he wasn't going to fail with the camp. It was all he had, his legacy, his beginning. If he could make a go of it and turn it, sell it as a successful little business instead of a rundown piece of lakefront property that would be of little to no use to anyone except some businessmen from the cities who wanted to use it as a hunting retreat, then he could make a profit on it. More importantly, he could establish himself as a real estate speculator who had taken a worthless piece of property and made something out of it. That was the sort of thing that banks would look favorable upon, and it would allow him to pyramid his investment, to get into something more ambitious, something he could build upon. You've got to start somewhere, he thought. You've got to have a dream. Why couldn't Alice see that? Maybe he just couldn't compete with that guy out in California. Maybe that was it. Maybe all Alice wanted was a reason to go back to him because he could offer her more and she was using the camp as that reason. If that was the case, he couldn't fight it and he wasn't going to try. Alice was old enough to know her own mind. She wasn't a child and yet sometimes she acted like one. He started to reveal his plans, his dreams for a better future, and he'd see her shut him out. She didn't even want to hear it. He had thought that if she could see the place, if she could come out and see what he had done, actually participate in the project, then she might come to appreciate what he was trying to do. But no, she didn't really want to be there. She did her part, but her heart wasn't in it. She seemed to be one of those live for today types. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If everybody thought that way, no one would ever accomplish a thing. He had lingered in the town partly because it had started storming and he wasn't anxious to drive back in the storm. He had been hoping it would let up, but at the same time, he wasn't looking forward to spending another night with Alice, with her trying to convince him it was all a pointless waste of time. She didn't see the potential of the place, its possibilities for success. She saw it as a romantic retreat, 
a place where apparently she had hoped she could get him to loosen up and not take life so damn seriously. They had each come to the camp with their individual goals in mind. He had hoped to get her interested in what he was trying to do, to get her involved so she could share his plans with him. She had hoped she could get him to walk along the lake shore and gaze up at the stars, stop and smell the damn roses. Only someone had taken the time to grow and tend the rose before anyone would smell them. Alice didn't seem to understand that and obviously wouldn't try. He sighed and pushed away his coffee cup. Hell, what was the point? It just wasn't going anywhere. Neither of them was going to change. Maybe she would be better off going off to California. Maybe he'd be better off as well. Steve, said Sandy, coming over to him. Is there anything else you want? Oh, no, no thanks, Sandy. I'm fine. You can't go back out there in that rain, she said. You want to get drowned No, no, but, but I got to, Steve sighed. I've got six new counselors up at the camp. Uh, they're babes in the woods in every sense of the word. Well, they'll be okay if they know enough to come out of the rain, Sandy said, smiling. Well, what do I owe you? He reached for his wallet. Sandy smiled at him and winked from behind her harlequin glasses. Just a night on the town, Steve. He laughed. It was the same sort of comment she used to make whenever he was younger. It had made him feel important then that an older woman would flirt with him like that. Now it made him feel nostalgic for his youth. Come on now, Sandy, you know what I mean. She laughed again. Okay, two and a quarter. He counted out three bills. She walked over to the antique cash register and rang him up. Here's your change, Steve. No, you keep it, Sandy. Why, thank you. Sure. He put on his slicker and headed for the door. Now you drive careful out there, she said. I will. Good night. He put his hood up and ran to the jeep, pausing briefly to check the trailer hitch before he got in out of the rain. Stupid, he thought. He should have done all of this before the storm had started. Driving back from town with a loaded trailer on wet country roads at night was a good way to get into an accident. A jeep was not the ideal vehicle to pull a trailer. It was too light and its wheelbase was too short. He'd have to take it real easy. He wiped the inside of the windshield with his bare hand while he waited for the engine to warm up. Falling raindrops glistened in the glare of the headlights. They were all probably sitting around the fireplace in the main cabin tearing through the beer supply and smoking pot. He grimaced. He'd have to make a point of warning them about that. With everything that was known about marijuana now, you'd have to be an idiot to smoke the stuff. He knew it didn't necessarily lead to harder drugs but the effects of smoking it were even worse on the lungs than smoking cigarettes, or so he had been told. He didn't want to see any of that sort of thing around the kids when they arrived, and he knew that Dorf would dearly love any excuse to make a surprise visit to the camp and search for drugs. All he needed was for Dorf to find a stash and bust one of the counselors. He'd have to bail the kids out, there'd probably be a lawsuit from the parents of the campers, and it would provide the town council with the perfect excuse to shut the camp down. Of course, Alice probably wouldn't see it that way. She'd tell him to lighten up. He sighed and shifted the jeep to first gear. It gave a lurch as it strained against the weight of the trailer, and then slowly gathered speed. All he wanted right now was to climb into his cot and get a long night's sleep. Just forget about his problems and sink into the darkness. Okay, Slashaholics, you've just heard an early access upload from the Patreon page. On Patreon, you'll get early access to this book and others to be named in the future. All great slasher novels. All early access titles on Patreon will have weekly chapter uploads that premiere on Patreon two to three weeks before they make it to YouTube. So, if you want to have early access to Friday the 13th by Simon Hawk, head on over to Patreon. Thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're enjoying this book so far. And as always, pleasant dreams!